people still walking in, so we'll wait some a little bit longer. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. This is our fourth night, I think. Um, so we had a, a week off last week, so I'll do a little review, quick review of all the stuff we've been through, and then we'll jump into today's topic, which is the liturgical life. But first, we're going to pray. It's going to be liturgical. Um, so the prayer is the collect, the opening prayer from Holy Thursday Mass. So I thought that was fitting for today's topic. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us pray. O God, who have called us to participate in this most sacred supper, in which your only begotten Son, when about to hand himself over to death, entrusted to the Church a sacrifice new for all eternity, the banquet of his love. Grant, we pray, that we may draw from so great a mystery the fullness of charity and of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Um, so, our, so our first week here, we talked about what is man? Who are we as human beings created in the image and likeness of God? And um, just a few quick things that Father J.D. talked about was um, we have an intellect, a will, and passions. Um, and all those things are good. So we shouldn't be afraid that we can rationalize things are that we can make decisions or that we have these these desires these emotions because they're all created from God and they're all good and they're all created for God for us to love and serve God and that he desires us to use all of that for his greater glory um, and the second thing that I want to review on from Paul JD's thing was that we're made for communion that we're, we're made to be isolated we're made to be in communion with God and with each other um, which kind of goes in with today's topic of liturgical life, but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then Father Bruce, in the second week, talked about who God is and how. Oh. And who, um, that God is our Father, capital F, um, and that he loves us and desires to be in that communion with us that he created us for that we talked about in the first week, and that we have to, sometimes we can have bad images of our fathers, our people that were, that were supposed to love us and care for us, that, but we have to try to purge that because God the Father isn't like that, and he desires us, and he sent us his son on the cross because he loves us, and he wants to be with us forever in eternal life. Um, and then two weeks ago, Jen talked about, okay, so we're, we know who we are, and we know who God is. How do we put those two together? We talked about prayer and how it's mostly not about ourselves, but about God and about others, about that communion that we were created for. And she went through a couple of different types of prayer that we can participate in, and the one that y'all had homework for was Lectio Divina, praying with the scriptures, the word of God, and um, hopefully y'all did some of those. Um, and, uh, yeah, and now we're here today talking about the liturgy, the liturgical life, the highest form of prayer, um, and, like, the highest way that we can be in communion with God and with each other. So, with all that, we're here for the liturgical life. Um, so, I want to start off with a rhetorical question, um, of if you've have you ever noticed how ritualistic we are as humans? Um, and how we always have certain um, routines that we have to follow, and if that routine gets thrown off, we like freak out, we don't know what to do, and our whole day is like thrown off. So, like for example, we have morning routines. We wake up at a certain <coughs> time, and um, so for me, I wake up, and then I try to exercise right away, because if I don't do that, I'm probably not gonna do it for the rest of the day. And it's the summer right now, so it's less hot. 
Um, and then, so I exercise, and then I'll go have my time with Jesus in my, my prayer time, um, probably doing Lexia Divina. And, um, and then I'll, whatever's for that day, I'll start. Um, but if I miss one of those, my whole day is off, and it just feels out of whack because I have this ritual that I set up, and I have to follow that ritual or everything's messed up. Um, and we also have rituals with sports. So if it's football season, we, we even figure out what mass we're going to go to so that we can not miss kickoff. Um, and if Father JD preaches too long and kickoff's happening, we'll get a little bit uncomfortable because we're going to miss part of the game. Um, but that's another ritual that we have that if it gets messed up, then we're, we're all out of whack. Um, so why did God make us like that? Why did God make us so ritualistic? Um, and hopefully we'll find the answer in the liturgy. Um, so, um, so from the, the Baltimore Catechism, the catechism we had before the catechism we have now, um, it says, why did God make you? God made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. And God, in his infinite wisdom, created the liturgy for us to be able to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and in the heavenly liturgy, which we get to participate in here now. And it's very ritualistic, as you've probably noticed. Every Sunday is the same thing. Um, and you know, the readings may be different, but the prayers are the same. The priests are saying the same thing. We sit, we kneel, we stand, we come up for communion, and then we go off. Um, and it can get very routine sometimes, and we, we can miss out on, on what God is trying to offer us in that ritual. But I, I, I think God did that for, for two reasons, which I don't know if I put that in the notes. So sorry about that. Um, but, so, reason number one is the glorification of God, and reason number two is the sanctification of man, of us. So, the first, first one, the glorification of God, through this ritualistic liturgy, um, I think God did that so that we would worship Him. We wouldn't worship this false image of God that we have, or we wouldn't worship our t- TV screen, we wouldn't worship certain people, but we were to worship God because he set up this ritual for us to be able to do that. And if we follow that ritual, then we're worshiping the true God, not the false image of God that we can have. And in, in that ritual, the Mass, um, we have certain things that we, we put the best forward. So our chalices are always gold. We have marble altars. We have candles. We have really beautiful images in church. And we usually, like, wear our Sunday best because we want to give our best to God. And that's what he desires us to do through this ritual of the liturgy. And it shouldn't change from Sunday at 11, 7, and 9 to the rest of our life. We should live a liturgical life and always be giving God our best, whatever that may be, in whatever way that is for us. But we can make what we do in the liturgy giving God our best part of our everyday life. That way we can worship God and not something else. And the second reason, the sanctification of man, which is my favorite part of the reason, because um, I want to get to heaven. Um, but, so, the liturgy, and St. Saint Saint Peter writes about this, I put this one in the notes, um, makes us like God. We can only get to heaven if we are like God. Um, so I'll, I'll read the, the scripture passage. It's from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Um, so St. Peter says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. So the liturgy, in its very ritualistic way, is making us more and more like God every time we participate in it, um, which is really cool. 
Um, and so I think that we can look at two of our feast days that we do in the liturgy, Christmas and the Ascension. And it makes this a little bit, it makes a little bit more sense for this. Because for Christmas, we have God who became one of us, became man, um, which is a very mysterious thing because God is so far above us, but he decided to become one of us in a little baby, Jesus. Um, and then Jesus lives his life. He, he preaches. He, um, Good Friday happens. He dies. Easter Sunday resurrects. And then ascension happens. And we usually overlook the ascension because it's just another, another Sunday that we go to. But the ascension is very important for us to be able to get to heaven um, because Good Friday and Easter Sunday wouldn't have meant anything if the ascension didn't happen. Because the ascension, and what happens is, so at Christmas, God becomes man, and then the ascension, man gets to seat up in heaven with God. So, we, Jesus brings the humanity, our humanity, up into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God. So because of that, we, they call it the ongoing ascension, we can the rest of the body of Christ can now ascend to heaven and be seated at the right hand of God and become like God and be with God forever in heaven. Um, so I think there's, there's two prayers in the, the Mass itself that point to these two things. And so for the first one, the glorification of God, there's that point in the Mass where the priest is behind the altar, he's already said the words of consecration, and then he, he prays for the church, Pope Francis, not a bishop, um, don't have one. Um, and then, like, those who have died, and then he lifts up the bread and the wine, and he says, through him, in him, with him, O God and mighty Father, and you and the Holy Spirit, all glory and honors is yours forever and ever. Um, so, like, I think that part of the liturgy summarizes the first part, the glorification of God, that through Jesus' sacrifice, through the mass that he's given us, like, this is what we're here for, to glorify God forever and ever, eventually in heaven. And the second part, which we don't ever hear, because it's one of the, the secret prayers, one of the prayers the priest says quietly, is, um, so at, during the offertory, um, the bread, he says the prayer for the bread, we say, blessed be God forever. And then he takes a little bit of the water and puts it in the wine, and he says quietly, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we share in the divinity of Christ, who home and himself is share in our humanity. I think that summarizes the second part of why the liturgy is like this, of the sanctification of us. That because Jesus became one of us, we can now become like him in heaven. Um, and, uh, yeah, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, so, if you look at the um, book of Revelation, which is a scary book for a lot of us, but in, in Revelation, we see a lot of what happens in the Mass. And it's, it's the heavenly liturgy that St. John has shown. So we're participating in what's going to happen in heaven forever, right here on earth. We get a little taste of that. And that's why it's so ritualistic, because it's something away and apart from this world. Because if it was, some, if, if it was like anything else in this world, it, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be different, it wouldn't be special. Because it's not part of this world, it's, it's from heaven that we get to participate in a little bit. Um, yeah, um, so... The quote underneath the scripture passage that I just read um, is from a guy named Jean Carbone. He's a French priest who um, helped, write of the, helped write part of the catechism that we have now, the part on prayer. Um, so he's talking, in, he has a book called The Wellspring of Worship, and he's talking about the ascension and, and Christmas and how like, all of that makes sense in like, the liturgy and the sanctification of man. And he writes this, what we call the sacraments are in fact the demonizing actions of the body of Christ and our own very humanity. So in all of the sacraments, baptism, Eucharist, confession, matrimony, holy waters, um, there's two more. Um, every, every part of those, every sacrament is, is um, helping us become more like Christ, more like him and his, and his humanity, because that's the only way we become like Christ, because he's one of us. But he's also God. So we get to be more like him as more and more as we participate in the sacraments and become more sanctified and give more glory to God. Um, so this is why the Mass is so important 
the other sacraments are so important because without these, we wouldn't be giving right glory to God, and we wouldn't be being sanctified. We wouldn't be able to get to heaven. We wouldn't be more and more like Christ every day. And so things like what we talked about last two, week, two weeks ago with Jen about personal prayer, Lexio Divina, all that stuff is very important, but it's not worship. It's not liturgy. It's, it's personal prayer. Um, and the liturgy is something different because we're participating in the saving action of Christ and being demonized, sanctified. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not important. Because, so say, um, like in your marriages, say you, you wouldn't have ever met the person before you got married, and you just showed up and you got married, and then you had to live the rest of your life together. So that would be very difficult, I would assume. Um, but if you're building that relationship through personal prayer, um, or through like dating and stuff, then when you come to that day of marriage, it's a, it's a special day, and then for the rest of your life, you're living out that sacrament. So it's the same way with, with our personal prayer and with the Mass. We're like building that relationship with Jesus, we're building that trust with him, that intimacy with him. So when we come to Mass, it's more special. And then every day after encountering him in the liturgy, we are able to live out that liturgical life. We're able to glorify him in our daily lives and become more like him. Um, so there's, so I'm talking about the Mass a lot, but there's two other parts of the liturgy. Um, there's what's called blessings. So there's a big book called the Book of, Ble- book of Blessings, which um, priests and deacons can, can go and bless, like, basically anything, like houses, cars. They can bless your marriages. They can bless all types of things. So it's, it's liturgical actions that have become part of our everyday lives. Um, so we're able to be sanctified in stuff that's even apart from Sunday liturgy part of our daily lives, and we're able to encounter Christ in that, give glory to God, and become sanctified through those daily things. And then there's also the Liturgy of the Hours, which I know some of y'all are praying, shout out to mom, um, which sanctifies our time. So throughout our day, there, there's five hours that priests and religious are required to pray. Um, so it's not only sanctifying through so the liturgy is not only sanctifying our every, everyday things through blessings, but it's also sanctifying time through liturgy of the hours. Because at certain points of the day, that you pray certain prayers. And then the highest one is, is the Mass, where our, our, our whole, our salvation is, is procured. So why is um, the Mass the highest of those three? Which we talked about a little bit um, but so in the, in the Mass, we're participating in Jesus' priestly prayer to the Father. So that's why it's more important than our personal prayer, because it's Jesus' prayer that we get to participate in. And Jesus is God praying to, to the Father. So we get to participate in that prayer. And it's, a, it's, a, it's got a little more turbo, I guess, on it. It's got a little more charge on it. Because it's not our prayers, it's, it's God's prayers to God. And um, it's, his prayers are are what saves us and sanctifies us. Um, and we get to participate in that to the Father when we pray in the liturgy. Which is why, another reason why it's so ritualistic, because it's not our prayer, it's Jesus' prayer, it's someone else's prayer that we're getting to, to participate in. And so the most powerful prayer that Jesus made was from the cross, which is why we have crucifixes in our churches, and which is why the central part of the Mass is, is the consecration of the bread and wine, which is his body and blood, which he gave up for us, for the Father. Um, so, Catechism uh, 1009, no, 1069, my bad, tells us that Jesus, through the liturgy, is continuing the work of our redemption in, with, and through his church. Um, so Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was enough for us to be saved. But um, he wants, through his church, for us to reach more and more people through that sacrifice, through that, that um, offering on the cross to the Father. So he entrusts his apostles, who then entrusted their successors, and on and on and on, um, to today. And the church is what brings that vehicle of salvation to everyone, to the whole world. That, sacrifice, that one sacrifice to the whole world. Um, and so Jesus had to, had to find a way for his 
um, his sacrifice to work through the church, which is what we call the liturgy, um, which is the main source of God's grace. Not that God can't give us his grace outside of the liturgy, but he wants to give it through the liturgy because that's a sure way that we can know that we're receiving grace from God. Because in our personal prayer, sometimes we can hear God's voice and sometimes we don't hear anything. So it's very difficult to like know if, if something, like we know God's listening to our prayers, but it's very difficult to know if, if, they're, if, they, like, if the prayer's already been answered or if we have to wait a little bit longer or if it's being answered in a different way. But in the liturgy, it's, we know that Jesus' sacrifice is, is being worked through, through the priest. The liturgy is the main source of God's grace, and it's the surest source of God's grace, because he, he told us that, hey, like, if you do these, like, if you baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and if you say the words of institution, like, I'm going to show up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my miracles and my grace through that. Um, and um, so uh, also, in the liturgy, not only with that, it being the surest way of grace, it's also a way um, in our prayer that we can remember what God has done for us and know what God is doing for us now and what he will do for us in the future. Um, so if we go back to the opening prayer, which I don't think I put in the notes, I didn't. Um, but so there's every opening prayer and closing prayer in the liturgy is broken up into three sections. The first is what's called the anamnesis, um, which is that part of us remembering what God has done for us in the past. Um, so if we read, well, if I read um, the opening prayer that I started off with is, um, O God, who called us to participate in this most sacred supper, in which your only begotten Son went about to hand himself over to death, entrusted to the church a sacrifice new for all eternity, the banquet of his love. So that's the, like us kind of reminding God, like, hey, like, you did this all those years ago. Um, like, you, like, your son, when he was about to die, like, entrusted to us the Mass. And it was for all of eternity, it says. He entrusted to the Church a sacrifice new for all of eternity. So, like, us kind of, like, reminding God, like, hey, you've been there for us in the past. And, like, reminding ourselves, too, that God has shown up, and he's He's shown up in the past, and he's, gonna, he's not going to give, give up on us. He's not going to change from what he did in the past. Um, and then the second part of the prayer, called the epiclesis, is when we ask God for something. So like, God, you did this in the past. Help us now. So the second part of that prayer is, Grant we pray that we may draw from so great a mystery the fullness of charity and of life. Like us, remind, so reminding God, like, hey, the last supper happened. Give us those graces now so we can reach the fullness of charity, so we can become divinized and become like you forever and eternity. And then the last part of the prayer is called the doxology, which is us asking through Jesus' name. So Jesus tells us in, um, I wrote this part down. I think it's the Gospel of Matthew. Not sure, um, but he, he says, anything you ask in my name, I will give to you. It's Gospel of John. Anything you ask in my name, you will give to, I will give to you. So every, if you notice, every prayer in the liturgy is either the long form, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, or through Christ our Lord. So everything we ask is through the Son. It's through Jesus' his intercession. Because God's going to listen to his beloved son, and he's going to give him what, what he asked for. So we asked in his name, especially in the liturgy. So, if we do that in the, the liturgy, why can't we do that in our personal prayer? Make our prayers more liturgical. And like, throughout our lives, like, live a liturgical life. And like, while we're going through life, say like, we, um, if we have like a job interview coming up, um, we can be like, I remember God, he's shown up for me in the past all these times, and he's always been there for me, and he's not going to abandon me. So why would, he, why would he change now and not show up for me now? Um, and then we can 
once we remember that and know that God's going to be there, we can ask for his, for his help. Like, hey, I got this job interview, Lord, coming up. I know you've never abandoned me in the past, so please be with me now. And then ask through Jesus' name to kind of ensure that he'll listen to our prayer. Yeah, that, that's a lot of, um, like, what, what the prayers are, why is the liturgy important, um, so now we'll talk a little bit about the communal aspect of it, um, the, like the vertical communion, us and God. Um, so as, um, as Catholics, we believe that we have like, a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, and that he's, he's always working through all th- three of those in our lives. Um, so it's no different in the liturgy. Um, so if we go through... Trinity throughout the liturgy, and we have the Father, um, who is the source and goal of all of the prayers in the liturgy. Everything is directed to the Father. None of it's directed to the, to the Son or the Holy Spirit, unless there's like a special solemnity or feast day, but mostly it's, it's all prayers directed to the Father. Um, so like as in the opening prayer, O God, who have called us to participate in this most sacred supper in which your only begotten Son. So we're talking to God the Father through all of our prayers in the liturgy. Um, and he's, he's the, the source and goal of all those. And in our lives, he's the source and goal of all of our lives. Whether we know it or not, we're all created to, to go back to the Father in heaven. Because we were with him in the garden before original sin. And ever since then, we've been trying to get back to him. In the garden. The Father in the liturgy is the source of everything, and in our life, He's the source and goal of everything. And then we have the Son, who is who's the one praying in the liturgy. Like I said before, we're, we're entering into Jesus' prayer in, in the liturgy, um, and He's the one that is. He's with us in the Blessed Sacrament. He's, he's with us through all the, um, the other sacraments, baptism, confession, um, matrimony, groaning of the sick. It's Jesus who's in the place of the priest, the persona Christi, the priest. So Jesus is the one that's doing all of the sacraments, not through, through the priest. Um, so and, and if he's the one acting in our lives in the, in the liturgy, in our lives— why can't we walk through our lives with, with Jesus and have him as our companion through our life, doing everything with him and asking him for help and guidance as we go along? And then we have the Holy Spirit, who is the one always preparing us to encounter the Lord. So his, his name isn't said a lot in the liturgy, but it's through the Holy Spirit that our prayers are being sent to the Father through the Son and that we're receiving the graces back from the Father. So the Holy Spirit's always the one that's helping us to encounter the Lord in the prayers, and he's helping us to recall God's saving action through the liturgy. So like with the Father and the Son, why can't that be like in our, in our lives, our daily lives now? Always asking the Lord to help us encounter Jesus as we walk through life with him, or to help us to go back to the Father in our and everything we're doing. Um, so that's, that's the, the vertical aspect, communal aspect of the liturgy. And then at the end of Mass, we're sent out. The Lord, uh, the priest, the Lord, I guess, all the Christies, um, tells us the Mass is in the go in peace, or the Mass is in the go and announce the gospel of the Lord. There's various options. Um, but we're, we're not only to go to the liturgy and receive something, but we're also called to go and share what we have with everyone else. So that's where the, the liturgical life part comes in. Like we go receive God's grace in the liturgy, we give him glory, and we're sanctified. And then we're called to go out and live that life with everyone we meet. And help them to get to that point where they can also glorify God and be sanctified. And while doing that, we're also glorifying God and sanctifying ourselves.
So the liturgy feeds us so that we can go and feed the world. Yeah, so all of that is fine and dandy and everything, but why does, why does that matter for me personally? Like, why, why should I care about going through this ritual um, and, like, receiving the sacraments? Um, like, why, like, like, why can't that be someone else's thing? Why does it have to be, to be my thing? So, two reasons. The first is that we ourselves are sacraments. We're also liturgical, like, in our, just our very existence and being. Um, we're mirrors of the Trinity. So we're, with the Father, we're beloved sons of the Father. So I'm always told when p- people meet me, they always want to ask, like, who my mom and dad is. And when I tell them, like, oh, yeah, like, I see him and you, I see her and you. Like, you act like your dad, you act like your mom. And, which makes sense because, like, I, I come from my mom and dad. So I should be like them, I should look like them, act like them. And so if we come from the Father, shouldn't we act like God the Father and look like God the Father to the world? And the more we, we encounter him in the liturgy, the more we can resemble him and act like him in the world. And we're, so we're beloved sons of the Father, altar Christus, by virtue of our baptism. We're called to be other Christ in the world. So we're, we're called to be Jesus to everyone we meet. And the more we can encounter Jesus in the sacraments and in the liturgy, the more we can be more like him in the world. And then thirdly, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. So the the Holy Spirit came upon us in our baptism and our confirmation and dwells within us. And he's the one that's always leading us back to the Father. He's the one that's always um, helping us to pray. Or um, like if we haven't been to confession in in so long, like why why do we all of a sudden want to go to confession? Because the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, urging us to go and back and encounter the Father. So that's the first reason why we should care. The second reason is, um, we talked a, a little bit about this, I think, in the first session, is that we're body-soul composites. So we're not just a body, or we're not just a soul. You can't split them, the two. We're, we're a body-soul composite. But what we do with one affects the other. Um, so like, for example, if you're, if you're exercising and eating right, then you're going you're gonna to feel better, and you're going to feel healthier, more, like, more good, better, um, and um, you're more joyful, more willing to help others, whatever. If you're taking care of your, your body, your, your spirit will be lifted, um, and vice versa. It's like if you're, if you're living in sin and you're not encountering the Lord in the sacraments, then you're just not going to feel happy, you're not going to feel joyful, you feel like something's missing. So you have to take care of the body, and you have to take care of the soul. Yeah, so the sacraments are real, first of all, um, and they have a real effect on our, in our bodies. So if we, can, if we walk through the sacraments, um, we, can, we can see how it affects the soul and it also affects the body. So the first sacrament we receive is, is baptism, um, which uh, adopts us as beloved sons of the Father, makes us altar Christus, symbols of the Holy Spirit, so it, it's helping our, our soul, it's bringing our soul back to life from original sin, from when we were first born and we had original sin. So it's giving us a chance to reach eternal life and, um, and to, to be with God forever in heaven. Um, so if, if, if our souls are now healthy, then we can, we can live our life and know that we, we have a community in the Catholic Church and that we have a place like in, in the world, like someone loves us, the, the church loves us, the Father loves us. Like that gives us security, and that gives us um, a purpose in life of like, hey, like now I'm I'm part of this this church community. I'm a Catholic now. I have a purpose. Like nothing is just is just up to chance now. Like I have a reason and a goal to achieve in my life. So you then so naturally we'll mess up in that. 
But we, we get to encounter the Lord again in confession. Um, so if we receive the Lord's mercy in confession, then we have to be like Christ and give mercy to other people. Right? If someone wrongs us or um, does something to our family or to one of our friends, like we should reach out in mercy because the Lord reaches out in mercy to us in the sacrament of confession. Um, so that will, so that receiving God's mercy in confession fills our soul and reaching out to other people fills that community that we have with each other. And obviously we have the Mass, which is where we encounter Christ in, a, in his, his body and blood, and we get to receive him, and through that become more like Christ, because we're actually receiving Christ. Like, you are what you eat, that cliche. Like, we're, if we're eating Christ, we're going to become like Christ. And go out and change the world, hopefully. And then you have the Sacrament of Matrimony, which is a very, um, like marriage is a very um, secular thing. Like you get married outside of the church, but um, seen as a valid marriage in the church, but it's a very secular thing, but we're adding the church and Christ into that and, and asking his blessing upon that to bring forth um, more people, more families um, to be loved to each other. Um, and then we, obviously we have holy waters, which is, as is, is how we can have the, the sacraments to begin with. We have, um, like you, we see vividly the person of Christ in our priest. And they're the ones that bring us, bring us to Jesus in the world. Um, and then lastly, anointing of the sick, which is the end of our journey in life. We, we get to experience Christ also in that, where he prepares us for the next life. So, yeah, with, with all of that in mind, um, and having our, our personal prayer helping us encounter the Lord in the liturgy, um, that should um, leave us changed, and that should leave us, leaving, we, we should leave Mass different than when we came into Mass, because we just encountered God in, in the sacraments. Um, so how do, how do we know if we're allowing that change to happen in our lives or if it's, if it's just, we're just letting it, that opportunity go by? Um, so there's a thing called a, a daily examine, um, which is going to be you know, homework for the week. Um, but I can walk us through how to do that real quick. If I can find the paper. So in so there's in the in the liturgy of the hours, which is what I talked about earlier. There's the last one you pray is compline or night prayer, and part of it is is making a daily examine, just going through your day, and um, seeing like if the Lord did the Lord and did I let that encounter change my life, or did I just let that opportunity go by? Um, so we have those the five steps on that that second handout. By the door, um, that y'all grabbed. Uh, so I can walk us through that, like we walked through the Lectio Divina thing last time. Um, so first, you want to put yourself in in God's presence. Um, I've always been told to give it a length of an Our Father, to just allow the Lord to to look at you and, and love you, and like imagine like the Father just just looking on you and loving you and receiving that love. Um, and then we always. I've always, when I first was doing an exam, and I would always just look at the bad things that I did, like how I messed up, um, and that was kind of like tough, like just starting off with, like, hey, I messed up this way, this way, this way, and this way, and then you're kind of just, at the end of it, you're like, whoa, that was, that was a waste of a day. Um, so I like how, in this version, it has you start off with gratitude, um, looking at the gifts and the good things that God has given you in the day, um, and just saying thank you for, for that day and all the things he gave you. Um, yeah, I think work first, starting off with gratitude, um, will, 
we'll be a little bit less harsh on ourselves because we like see how we did encounter the Lord and how He encountered us and all these gifts. And like, and it's like, hey, like it, it wasn't a waste of day. Like I actually encountered the Lord, and He was there, and He showed up, and He gave me something good in this day. Um, so the second step after you've thanked God for for the gifts He's given you. Um, is to just ask for, for one thing um, that, that, um, that we should either focus on, like a good, a good grace, or one um, way that we can improve better in the, in the, the next day. Because um, I think if we just focus on, on one thing instead of a whole list of things, then it's easier to make progress. And in letting the Lord... Um, encounter us and letting us encounter him if we just focus one step at a time. So we're asking the grace to, to find that one thing is how, where we start off with that. Because um, it could be, it could be hard to, to focus in on just one thing in your day. Um, so just ask the Lord to help you do that and to find that one thing that he wants you to focus on. And it might be different than what the one thing that you want to focus on but it's it, what the Lord wants you to focus on. It's what's best for you. Um, so after that is when you want to review your day and just kind of look at the stirrings of your heart. Um, um, like, did I encounter the Lord in this way? Or, or did I see that opportunity and, and step away from it and avoid it? Or did I just not even allow the Lord to, to encounter me today? I, I just closed my heart off to him. Um, so yeah, just to go through your day from when you woke up to, to when you're doing it at night, um, and to just look for that one thing, that one act of, of grace where like I encountered the Lord in a good way today, and, and look for that one way that you could you could have done better. Um, and then so after you find that that good thing and that bad thing, you want to ask forgiveness for that that way you messed up. Um, because obviously, the Lord loves us, but he also wants us to become better. He doesn't want to just leave us where we're at. He wants to journey with us so that we can become more like him and more um, sanctified, more divinized, and have eternal life with him in heaven. But we have to, we can't just look at him as, as if he's just going to, he's just like, yeah, it's okay, you messed up, but I, I really don't care about that. Like, I love you um, despite of that. So, like, so yes, he does love us, but he also wants us to, to ask for forgiveness and to, to try to do better um, and to repent and all that things. So, so that's step four, asking for forgiveness. And then the last step um, is, is just to like make a, like a renewal of like, okay, so I messed up this day. I'm going to ask the Lord for forgiveness. The next chance I can go to confession, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, so how can tomorrow I not make that same mistake again? How can I do better the next day? So yeah, that's five simple steps um, to find one grace from God and one way that you can do better the next day to encounter him better. Um, and to live a, a liturgical life. So that's, that's the first challenge. There's, there's two more. Um, so the other ones are just questions to bring to your own personal prayer. Um, so that we've talked about like how we have our, our personal prayer and how that enhances us to encounter the Lord in the liturgy and how the liturgy, um, the purpose of it is to glorify God, first of all. And then the secondary purpose is that God sanctifies us through that, that act of worship. Um, and uh, so we can't just leave that an hour on Sunday. We have to live our lives like that. We have to live our lives glorifying God. And if we do that, we're going to be one step closer to the kingdom of God. We're going to be sanctified more and more. Um, so with our, you can do these, these questions in your exam and prayer. You can have that guide your exam and prayer. Or you can do it in your, another time when you're doing personal prayer. But um, just ask the Lord in your prayer, like, am I? Am I living a life that gives glory to you? And secondarily, will sanctify myself? Or am I just 
leaving that for an hour on Sunday? Am I living the rest of my week giving glory to you? Am I living a liturgical life? Um, and see what he says. Uh, and don't be scared if you have, like, if the answer is like, no, I'm not. Um, like, that's, that's a start. Like, you, you're realizing that you're not doing that. And you can, you can start little by little to start living a liturgical life. Um, and if you are doing that, how can I do that better? So yeah, just ask the Lord that, and there's always ways that we can do that better, um, myself included. Just ask him, like, how, how can I do this better? How can I, like, please let me know, because I, I would like to be sanctified. Um, and uh, once um, you give the time, the time for the Lord to respond, just kind of, like, make, like, a, a game plan. Like, hey, next, next week I'm going to start doing this throughout my week. I'm going to start... Um, maybe shaping my personal prayers in the way that the liturgy has the prayers. Um, or maybe I'll just throughout the day just take time to, to stop and, and like say a glory be or something. Um, just something, it could be simple or it could be more complex than that, but just like make a game plan with the Lord on how I can live a better liturgical life for the rest of this, rest of my life throughout the week. Um, so that's the second part of the challenge. So you have daily examined prayer. Am I living a liturgical life? How can I do that better? And how am I living my life outside of the liturgy? Um, which kind of goes with the second one, but like is, is, like do people know that I'm a Catholic? Just how when they interact with me or, or if they're seeing me just walking around the street. Um, so that's a little bit easier for me because I, I wear this. Um, but like are, is your life a reflection of Christ? Are you being an altar Christus in the world? Are you being a beloved son or daughter of the Father? So just kind of in your examine, just examine your life also, like your external life. So the second question is more internal. Like how am I self internally living a liturgical life? And the third question is more externally, like is the way I'm living allowing other people to enter into that liturgical life too? So, um, that's everything I have for y'all today, um, and we'll end liturgically with glory be. Um, so glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank y'all.